Are we live? Awesome. I think we're live. Excellent. All right. So welcome back, everybody. It's been a little while, hasn't it? It's been, what, a full week since we last met. Um, I took a little bit of time off. I've got a crazy, hectic schedule. And we've covered pretty much mostly everything I wanted to talk about. We've covered all the basics. We're going to kind of uh, recap several of them. The last couple of things to touch on are kind of the finishing touches. We're going to learn how to take our sketches and arrange them, orchestrate them for whatever ensemble you want to work with. We're going to learn how to get some uh, rudimentary mixing on our sound. But all of that is for future lessons. For today, we're going to kind of create a midpoint break. The main idea here is, I don't know why I was staring at my mic. I should be staring at the camera. Um, but uh, the main point of today is to just have a chance to do Q&As. Most of these lessons I've kind of been focusing on the lesson plans. I've been focusing on teaching, on getting all the material across because we have so much material. I haven't really been spending a lot of time to actually answer all of your questions. So today's focus, I'm just going to keep touching up on things. We'll do a quick recap on what we've learned so far so that if you're joining us for the first time, you know where to find the different material you're most interested in. And then I'll just kind of work on the soundtrack get whatever I can done while I just answer each of your questions. So if you have any questions, throw them in the comments below. I will be happy to address all of them. Uh, and welcome, Greg. We've already got some people on here. Wonderful, wonderful. So as usual, we have a lesson plan beneath in the description of this video. You can right click, open a new tab. It'll take you right to this document. It has everything we're going to cover today, which typically is a lot more than this. This is just kind of a recap. But if you come back for, ooh, let's swap that, I don't like that. Uh, if you come back for any of the recorded lessons, there will always be a lesson plan filled with pages and pages of notes on everything we talked about. And if you are part of the Indie Film Music, Film, uh, con uh, Indie Film Music Contest's newsletter, they've been sharing these with each of you as well. So today, let's kickstart things with just a quick kind of recap of everything we've learned so far. Now, in lesson one, our primary focus was how do you actually start a new project? Because a lot of composers, they watch the movie and they immediately start running to write music. And that's great, but it can lead to all kinds of issues. All right, The first and foremost is you only get to watch the movie for the first time once. Every time you watch after that, you're starting to pick up on different details and get a little bit deeper into the story until you have this huge issue that many composers run into of over analyzing the film. And you start to get your head wrapped around all these really cool ideas that you wanna portray with your music, but they're not really things the audience cares about. So I talk about how in the first time, first time you're starting a new project, you should always start by summarizing the story. This anchor, as you can see, kind of focuses on the most important characters, the most important action, and this is going to act like your anchor. And I've already had to use my anchor a couple times in this series, where I start to overanalyze things because I've seen the film so many times, and I have to remind myself, whoa, 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 hold up, what is my summary? What is the story actually about that the audience cares about? And then after that, once you've got your summary, once you've understood what the care what the audience actually cares about. Step number two was to create your scene list. And if you've been following along with the series, you should understand by now how important your scene list is. In fact, I have mine over here. The scene list, remember, breaks down when does each scene start, when does it end, a few quick details about each scene, and then, of course, talking about our functions. What does the music need to do? Now, again, if you're new, as a recap, the three functions of film music are psychological, physical, and technical. Psychological is pretty self-explanatory. That's easy. It's portraying emotions. It's kind of in heightening the emotional experience of your audience. It can also be used to reveal thoughts and moods and underlining little things. So, for example, in a gangster movie, if two characters are being very friendly to each other, they're shaking hands, they seem kind of amicable to each other, the music can reveal the animosity and the tension underneath the scene. Maybe these two hate each other, but they have to act like friends. That's one of the psychological functions. Portray emotions and reveal underlying information. The physical function of music is to two parts, basically. One, 
to help create the setting, whether that's a physical setting, whether that's a time period, whether that's a general ambience or kind of season of the year kind of thing, or it can match hit points. It can underline things happening on screen. The most extreme example being Mickey Mousing, where the composer uses instruments to mimic every little action that the most interesting characters are doing. A more useful version, meaning just finding the individual hit points in your music and making sure your music underlines those and shifts. Um, then the technical function being about continuity. How are you using your themes, your sound palettes, etc., to kind of move forward? Uh, awesome, got some questions. Matt, welcome. Is scene one completed? No, not at all. In fact, if you look at this, I have not opened this file since our last lesson. All right, so I'm I am working on everything in front of you guys. Uh, so probably what the first chunk of today will be is kind of touching up on these this like initial section. We'll listen to it in a bit. Uh, and fixing up scene one before going to scene two. But like I said, today we're starting with a recap, and then most of today is just a chance for a Q&A. All right, we're at the midpoint of this class, pretty much. We've talked a lot about like the initial sketching process, how do you prep projects, how do you write your themes, how do you apply the music. After this, one, basically, we're having a midterm break right now for all of you to ask questions, to just kind of communicate, talk, figure out what you're confused about, what do you like want to know. Then starting with our next lesson, we'll start learning more about like the back end of things. How do you orchestrate your sketches? How do you mix your music? How do you find the right balance between dialogue and music, etc.? cetera? Um, but, uh, so yeah, great question. If you've got other questions, also during this recap, throw the questions in the comments now so that we can get started right away. And if you're looking to kind of follow along with this recap, link is in the description. So, in lesson two, we started learning a lot more about planning your character themes, your soundtracks, things like that. Because again, a film composer or media composer of any time is primarily a storyteller. So you need to know what story you need to tell first. So in my spotting notes, as you can see, figuring out each character's theme, I went through and I found out which characters actually need their themes. We went through character-related themes, world-related themes, story-related themes, and found out I wanted a theme for my piñata, I wanted a motif for the little girl, and then I wanted a specific sound palette. Then I used something called the nine parameters approach, which breaks music into nine distinct parameters. And then we basically, once we understand the characters we're trying to portray, we go through and we find out how each of these parameters can be used to portray our characters. And this is a fantastic tool because it allows you to understand what your music needs to sound like before you've even written it. So for example, let's look at what I how I described my piñata theme before we actually listen to the theme. All right, so I set a neutral tempo somewhere around the 75 to 90 BPM marker. I said I wanted my melody to be mostly quarter notes and half notes, but mostly eighth notes in the chords. All right, so with the rhythm, I wanted a little bit of a swing feel. I wanted to try to work with 3-4 time, but 4-4 four, four, or 12-8 were also accepted. And then after doing a little bit more of research on mariachi style music, because I wanted a very kind of folk music, local mariachi band kind of sound. And if you've been following, I've told you a couple stories about trying to recreate a little bit of the sound that I was used to growing up to, going to family get-togethers and parties where there was always a local mariachi performing. So I had a very specific ensemble I wanted to try and recreate from my sound palette. Um, so after doing a little bit more research, I found out that 12-8 would be fun to work with, try to do a sewn style. And the pitch mostly conjunct, meaning I wanted to move mostly by steps, have a couple leaps in there. And then I've got a couple other things, but the point being, by planning these things out ahead of time, by figuring out what I wanted my music to sound like and how it could portray my characters, it made the actual composing process much easier, which was actually lesson three, where we covered a bunch of kind of basic music theory for how you compose themes. So, for example, after all that information in mind, I was able to come up with this theme for my character. A nice kind of slow moving, relaxed, kind of folky type piece.
And this took me less than an hour to compose. It really did not take long. Uh, and the reason why is because before I started writing it, I had a description I was able to work with. I was able to go based off these ideas and take a lot of the guesswork out. Once I had an idea of the general personality, the general parameters I wanted to work with, I was able to just start writing music that fit that description. So again, if you want to follow along and learn more about that, that was in lesson two. Lesson four, we're getting caught up to the point we're at now, was about actual spotting. All right, so you'll find my spotting notes down here for scene one that we did together, where you break down the scene into distinct hit points. These are moments where the audience is given new information, and that new information is important to the story. It either shifts the energy, it shifts the emotion, or it just pushes the story forward. So in scene one, I decided that there were five hit points. There's the opening where the story begins, there's 18 seconds, eighth frame in, where we find the tick marks. So we figure out that it's important because it tells us how long the pinata has been alone. We have the 25 second marker in first frame where the we hear the door open, which shows that this long streak of no one coming to the store has just been broken. Then we have 31 seconds, 20, 20th frame where the pinata freezes because that gives us information that the piñata cannot move if it's being seen. It has to pretend to be inanimate, which is important because as the story progresses, the piñata's trying to escape the little girl. And the moment it gets seen, it loses. So that's an important rule that we need to match. And then we have 36 seconds, 15th frame, when the little girl finds the piñata. These, I thought, were the most important moments in scene one. And when you find these important moments, it breaks up your scene into distinct chunks and we can start to think about how the music can be used, which is most important, the sound effects or dialogue or music, the general energy level we wanna work with, what kind of emotions are important, what thematic material have we sketched that can be applied, and of course, what kind of texture or style do we wanna work with? As a reminder, texture meaning the number and types of layers in your music. Then, lesson five, our last lesson, was learning how to apply all that information to find a tempo for your film. Now, again, this is just a very quick recap. There we go, how do we get there? Uh, awesome. So we have a quick recap. All this information is really cool. It's all the kind of the technical aspects of film scoring. Again, as I've said a couple times, we're at the midpoint of the series right now, this class, this lesson, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, so since it's the midpoint, we're taking a break. We've covered all of the preparatory stuff. At this point, you should be composing your themes if you haven't already. You should be sketching out your entire film, creating the sound, and then from now on, we'll be focusing more on the functional things, like how, like I said, make, finding your arrangements, manipulating the size and energy, and yes, eventually mixing your sound. Um, no sound from the Cubase. Thank you, everybody. Let's see what's going on here. That's embarrassing. I apologize. Let's see, did that work? What's going on here? All right, so Cubase is giving me issues. All right. Let's see, does that work? And no, Cubase is not wanting to work with us. What is going on here? It's trying to get it to work with voice meter. What's going on here? This is very frustrating. I'm sorry, everybody. Oh my word. There's always something, isn't there? Always something. Let's try audio box all right can you hear it now does that help at all I'm running it through my audio box now all right let's see here so I know there's a little bit of lag with the things any audio no audio yet no all right awesome Beautiful. Why would there be audio, right? Testing. How's now? That should work. I don't know why Cubase. 
There we go. That should have fixed it. Is it better? Still no sound. This is so frustrating, right? This is part of the life of whatever this is. Uh, teaching, composing. Awesome. There we go. Finally. Oh, my word. It, can we not have one stream where something technologically doesn't go wrong? Or I don't know if I said that correctly. Anyway, so we should probably listen to that theme that I thought everyone was listening to. So, again, having that kind of idea where I was able to plan out what my theme should sound like beforehand, I was able to use that map to write this theme in less than an hour. It's just a piano sketch. It's nothing high quality. There's nothing super interesting about it just yet. But it works. And it's written in a specific style to work for mariachi. And then once I had this theme, oh yeah, I should probably point out the little girl's theme too. I also decided that I wanted the little girl to have a very short motif, something that could fit over a single chord because I knew that a lot of her scenes are fragmented, where we want to actually hint at her theme instead of use the whole thing, or we would want to bounce her theme around all over the place. So I had to come up with a quick motif, something short, that could play over a single chord and could have radically different personalities. So we have first the darker version. And then, if you play it over a major chord, a much sweeter type quality. And since it's so short, we can bounce it around, we can do all kinds of cool things with it, but it won't be as kind of long and lyrical as the Pinata's theme. And that can be used for a bunch of different stuff. All right, awesome. So we've got sound now, we're running well, people are showing up, awesome, happy for me, happy for you. We're done with the recap. All right, so like I said, it's a midpoint thing, all right? We've covered so much information. I'm just gonna kind of work on this film while you guys are here, and if you have questions, let me know. I'm going to basically flesh out this scene one because for now I have a general, very, very rough kind of uh, outline of my music. It's not complete. It's not fluid. It just has a general idea of what material I want to work with and where. So let's watch this scene together. Then we'll flesh it out and then we'll move on to scene two together, shall we? And along the way, if anyone has any questions, please throw them in the comments. This is, again, a Q&A session. This is a moment for us to talk, answer questions. It can be any uh, uh, touching on anything we've covered so far. It can be something completely different, something you've always wondered about. Um, anything. Yeah, throw it under. Let's watch this scene real quick while I wait for some answers to come through. <laughs> Got the Pinatas theme, kind of sad, lonely. I'm going to eventually arrange this for a folk band. Yes, there will be an orchestration episode. We'll be tackling basic premises for how to arrange your music. And then we're back to the theme. <laughs> all right so we've got a couple things we've got a rough sketch we've got some things we want to work with i've got the themes placed around it's time to kind of touch up um awesome we've got some questions though so uh, so first i saw matt's uh comment matt asked is there going to be a lesson on orchestration yes there will be our next lesson in fact uh i believe the next lesson will be one week from today uh, we're going to talk about arranging and orchestrating since I imagine all of you have different ensembles you want to work with. Some of you will want to work with a traditional orchestra. Some of you will want to work with just piano. Some of you, like me, are going to have your own kind of interesting arrangements you want to work with. Whatever it is, we'll be focusing on genre neutral tools for arranging. So what are, we'll talk about the three pillars of great orchestration. We'll talk about finding the right balance between instruments, how to keep your ideas interesting, how to find the best instruments to play your ideas out of your sound palette. All this really cool stuff that will be next lesson, but if you have specific questions about arranging, I'm not uh, against answering them today either. So just throw them in the comments, I'd be happy to answer. 
Then Greg asked, when making a motif, is the leap one of the first two notes of the motif? Uh, motif? Is the leap, um, so uh, let's see, so let me review that. When making a motif, is the first, is leap one of the first two notes of the motif? Um, yes, so whenever you're making a motif, I'm gonna assume you're asking is the first interval part of it. Um, yes, anything can be part of a motif. So I actually have a video where I talk about how you make a strong motif. And at the core identity, of any motif is something called um, self. Uh, I'm forgetting on the actual terminology at the moment, but the idea is uh, self-contradicting information, which is just kind of a fancy term. I'm not sure if that's the specific fancy term I used in the video. Um, uh, in, in, internal contrast. That's what's called an internal contrast. That's the fancy term. That's the one I was looking for. Internal contrast basically means that you are using different elements of your music that provides contrast. So internal contrast of rhythm means that you're using at least two different rhythmic values. Uh, internal contrast of pitch means that you are using at least two different pitches. Now, that comes as very kind of instinctive to most people. Most people will not write a motif that consists of absolutely no internal contrast. That's just not what we as human beings tend to associate with music. However, once you are aware of that vital ingredient, your ability to be deliberate with the types of internal contrast helps open so many doors for creating stories. So for example, two of the most common types of motifs are rhythmic and pitch related themes which is most melodic. The idea is you're using multiple different pitch values and multiple different rhythmic values to create a melodic idea. However, another type of motif that's very common is something that I like to call a timbral motif. And for this, we'll actually want to open a new instrument. And the idea is that you work with an interesting timbre instrument. You work with an expressive instrument, something that can change and morph its quality over time. And instead of focusing on rhythm and pitch, you focus on timbre and pitch. So let's find individual articulations. We'll go to celli and we'll go to long. All right. So for this, we could have just an interesting interval. So for a timbre based motif, which works really well for ambient soundtracks, for electronic soundtracks, if you have watched uh, the recent Spider-Verse movie, which I have been obsessed with that soundtrack, Daniel Pemberton uses a lot of timbral motifs, meaning he has an interesting sound that he associates with each of the characters rather than an, a full kind of melodic idea. Now, a more traditional approach to this would be something where you use uh, an instrument like a cello to perform a very interesting interval. Let's say we want to go with a minor third. Oops, let's unmute. You have your minor third. All right, very quiet. And you just add a shape to it. All right, you get louder, you get softer, you add a change in technique. You could start with just a kind of simple sound and then get add a vibrato or tremolo or anything you kind of want to do to it. But the idea is your primary focus for this kind of motif is creating an interesting sound, not necessarily a melody. And to do that interesting sound, you typically want to pick an interesting interval and then find a way to shift your sound as it goes in a way that helps portray the character. Does that make sense? Hopefully that helps. Um, let's see, is this story told from the perspective of the pinata or does it switch? Um, that's an interesting question. Personally, I find that it's just the pinata's point of view the entire time. Uh, we follow the pinata through the entire story. However, that would be something you could control for your music. Sometimes you could play it. If you decided that at some point you want to swap to the little girl's perspective, or maybe even the store owner's perspective, whatever, anyone's perspective that you'd like, you can kind of force that perspective with the music. However, it does come down to that idea of what story are you telling, and which we spent so much time kind of focusing on. Um, and Matt asks, any more interview videos? Not at the moment. I haven't been able to send out any. So I assume uh, Matt's talking about my recent interview with Zach Heidi, which I had a ton of fun with. Um, I do have plans for composers to reach out to that I want to interview and talk with. 
but we'll have to wait and see. Um, uh, I have to get, get the time of my schedule to reach out first. It has been a very hectic schedule. But it looks like, oh, awesome. I'm glad I was able to help Greg. It looks like I've caught up on the different questions for now. So um, I'm going to get to work on this soundtrack. If anyone's got any questions, again, please throw them below. In the meantime, I'm just going to kind of go through here and I will address it as I make my decisions. All right. So we're walking in. Eventually, I'll arrange this. But... You know what, I feel like that's a bit too abrupt. I might have to change this. So, what if I just kind of run the ideas into each other a bit more? So, let's go back to my original motif, my original theme. What was I doing here? All right, so let's do this. Let's go over here. In fact, first let me double check to see if I've got a different chord underneath. So underneath here, when I come here, I've got a B major. Let's go to my actual soundtrack. Basically my idea is since this is a bit abrupt for my liking, I'm just going to complete the idea. So, Let's see, make sure we don't have any conflicting. So this looks like it's an A flat major. You thought that should work. Let's do C. Oh yeah, that's nice. Since I've got, now since I'm not completely ending the piece, I feel like that sounds a lot more um, whole. It sounds like it's not kind of left um, unanswered. Cause you wanna be aware of having too many kind of what they're called holes, all right? In music, there are two basic issues you can run into. There are bumps and there are holes. A hole is when something is missing, something that your audience feels like it's supposed to be there and you just kind of lost attention because of it. It kind of throws your audience off their groove, something was missing and now they're not enjoying it. A bump is kind of like the opposite. It's when something happens something that necessarily shouldn't have been there or something that was too abrupt or unprepared or something that kind of shakes your listener and again, makes them focus on that. Um, so the primary differences here is a hole makes your audience lose interest altogether or a bump makes your audience pay attention to something that shouldn't be paid attention to. Um, don't know if my explanation was very helpful. Uh, but right here, what I had was a bit of a hole. I had something missing and it was kind of pulling my audience out of the moment or at least me, I'm my audience at the moment. So I like that. Let's start over here and we'll start watching again, see what else is missing. <laughs> All right, so now we've got a couple measures worth of rest. All right, two measures in fact. What we just heard was the Pinata's theme being interrupted, and now we have the sweet version of the little theme. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to mute everything else so it's just the piano. So we've got the theme, we've got a little moment where I want some kind of little run up, is what I was, that's for. It's not it's gonna be final, but I've got two measures. I need to find a way to transition from this to this news key center. All right, so over here, my looks like my chord is G major, whereas over here, first chord is C major. So it looks like I modulated once across the, uh, uh, I modulated one movement around the circle of fifths. I went from C major to G major. So one of the quickest ways to do this is to use something called a secondary dominant. Secondary dominant says that you take your target chord, in this case, oops, I've got it set to the celli. Let's go to the piano. We've got our secondary dominant. We've got our target chord, which is G major. Let's go up an octave. If I take the fifth of that chord, which is D, 
and all I gotta do is build a dominant seven, or just a dominant chord. On that D, it will want to resolve to my target chord. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build that D7. Let's drop this down. Let's lower the velocity so it's not as strong. And then I'm going to extend this by using a 2-5 cadence. 2-5 basically means I've got the fifth of my target chord. So it's G major, the fifth is D in G major. So I built a dominant seven chord on top of D. To create the 2-5, I'm going to create the five of my dominant, and I'm gonna build a minor chord on top of that. All right, so let's see. So in theory, this should sound very smooth. See. Yeah, sorry. I am not a piano player, as you can tell. It's going to create a nice kind of satisfying sound. The question is whether that will work how I want it to here. So let's go in for a little bit. So it's sounding muddy. I'm going to have to change that. But all in all, I feel like the transition works. So let's just fix this so it sounds prettier. All right, so Greg asks, is the theme used for other parts of the story, such as mariachi music or other scenes, or do you use different music for different scenes? Um, it depends. Personally, I'm going to use this theme a lot, all right? and most movies will. So this goes back to those three functions of film music that we talked about in lesson one. The idea that film music plays a physical role, it plays a psychological role, and this particular reason, it plays a, uh, it plays a, uh, what's the word, I don't wanna say functional function, because that doesn't make sense. Uh, it plays a, uh, I am blanking on stuff today. My, I, I should pick a different time for these, shouldn't I? My mind is always fuzzy here. Uh, technical, I wasn't able to find it on the lesson plan, but it's the technical, there it is. Uh, technical function, basically means how do you use continuity within your music to tell your story. Most of the time, nine times out of 10 in modern films, the way we use that is through leitmotif, which is the strategy of assigning a theme or a motif to specific characters, worlds, ideas, etc. Then every time the associated ideas appear on screen or appear in the story, you use that theme in your music. So every time the pinata has a kind of big moment, I'm probably going to use its theme, all right? When the little girl has a big role in the film, I'll use her motif. There's all kinds of different ways you could do this. However, that's not the only strategy. Another strategy is called a reoccurring genre. And this is a strategy that was used very effectively throughout all kinds of movies. One of the most famous examples being Back to the Future by Alan Silvestri. And the idea of a repeating genre is that you have one primary theme, all right? And that theme is used everywhere. It's used all throughout the movie. It's not really tied to anything other than your movie. But instead, what you use are your sound palettes. You have specific sounds used for specific emotions, specific moments. So anytime there is a triumphant moment, the theme is performed with big brass fanfares. Anytime there are sad moments, it's a sad kind of melancholy choir or string ensemble. Anytime there's tension, you can use tense strings and woodwinds. Whatever you do, the idea is like you're not focusing so much on how the melodies and themes tell your story as much as you are how their style and performance is helping to tell the story. Um, so there's really no shortage to the different ways you can do this. Again, um, Daniel Pemberton in the most recent uh, Across the Spider-Verse movie. I've been listening to that soundtrack on repeat. I can tell you I probably have it memorized by now. Um, the idea for his score is that each character has its has their own little motif. Usually it's an electronic sound. Some characters like Spider-Punk have more of a general kind of, uh, not so much a motif as a general style that's used in the music. There were no real themes in the soundtrack. There's no recurring melody or sound palette, but those motifs are used frequently. This gives the composer tremendous freedom to change styles, to change uh, 
effects to change genres, as is very important for telling a story that takes place in multiple dimensions across the Spider-Verse. And using those little motifs and changing their emotional context allows them to tell a story without being anchored down to full-length melodies, styles, genres, etc. Um, I forgot what the original question was. Um, but no, yeah, so yeah, long story short, yes, I will be using this theme throughout the film. I'll arrange it, I'll change it, I'll add variety, I'll develop it, etc. But the theme itself will be at the core. Uh, welcome, Alex. Welcome. I'm sorry, but I would really like you to listen to Toby Fox's music. He writes perfect themes for his characters. I advise you to listen to, for example, Big Shot. Awesome. I'll do that. Uh, I have a pen here somewhere. And, ah, yes. I have a to-do list that I print off every day. And I leave a couple blank spots on the bottom where I can add new things. All right, so Toby Fox. All right, so listen to... Toby Fox, and then you recommended Big Shot. Big Shot. Thank you, Alex. I'm excited. I always love listening to new music and checking new things out. My desk is super cluttered at the moment. Um. So yeah, let's figure this out. Let's voice this up a little bit. Let's do. Let's stick with the original style for now. See what happens. We'll do A flat. Then we'll do E flat drop this down we'll bring this up um where is it oh wait no that was the wrong chord i didn't want to change that that one stays the same um let's bring these up let's get rid of the let's get rid of the c actually we don't need this to be a full minor seven and let's bring this up just out of the way and what we'll have is an a minor so let's go with and a in uh, E, A, and then we'll do A, we'll do uh, D and A. So then we'll bring this down a little bit. We will, okay, what beat are these on? These are on the ands. So let's do, you know what, we'll just leave it for now. Let's listen to this transition real quick, see if it's any smoother. chop this up so at this point I'm just trying to make a little bit more sense and it's always more difficult to kind of compose on command in front of people but because my attention is kind of divided but it's all right it's part of the job at the moment and then it's on two and four let's take these let's shorten them to like 16th of notes is about what the other ones are and then we'll shorten each of these so they're just quarter notes Let's see how the whole thing works. All right, exciting moment. The little girl has entered. It helps us transition a little bit. We just need to fix this little run. There needs to be some kind of run. I don't need this to be perfect at the moment. I don't need this to be the final run I want. All I'm trying to do is show off that at this moment, this is a hit point, and in my notes that I took during the hit points, I said I wanted a quick little as the uh, pinata freezes. So let's see. It's For now, it's a D major. Let's just do a quick arpeggio, shall we? And we'll take, copy and paste this, raise it an octave, and then let's actually. We'll do. And let's shorten all of this. All right, let's make it much quicker because I don't like it taking up the entire measure. But again, the idea here is I'm not trying to create the final product, I'm trying to get my ideas down. 
I want a general sketch that I can work with because the final arrangement will be created as I start to actually orchestrate all of this material. But for now, I just need something to guide my orchestrations. And using the spotting notes that we learned how to make in lesson three, I've got an idea of what themes to use and where, and the general shape, energy, and emotions that I'm trying to portray with the music. So let's try this again. Let's pull up the video. So it probably won't be the final one, but it gets the point across it, emotions that I need on the run there. So here is where I actually want to change things up a little bit as well. So this was an idea that was shared with me by Tamashi, one of the uh, folks who was here on the last stream, uh, where they pointed out, well, first, Greg was the first person to email me and point out, hey, the license plate says killer on it. Then Tamashi, another person uh, who's usually in the comments, uh, gave the idea of like, what if we made the music darker at this point? And at first I was like, eh, not, I don't think I'll do that. But I actually think I am this time. I really like that idea. It's been stuck in my head. I don't know why I didn't decide to do that initially. But I like the idea of kind of forced, like uh, um, foreshadowing kind of the doom of the piñata. So for these last couple of measures, I want it to get darker, particularly in measure 13. So that's pretty low. This is very low, isn't it? Uh, is it always this low? No, it's usually up here. So let's, let's go that modulated. That's right. So let's move up an octave. Let's change the voicings. Actually, let's change the voicings first. And I'll probably have to change the arrangement eventually to make it work. But let's see here. So that's a D major to an F sharp diminished. So the F sharp diminished works, but what if we tried doing a D minor? So yeah, what if we just switched to an F minor? And then let's raise this an octave. Let's raise this an octave so it doesn't sound so dark. still doesn't sound quite dark enough. Let's pull this up to the footage. Let's see what it looks like. Um, any questions? Everybody is being super quiet. It's a Q&A episode. And there are no questions? Usually you guys are like sending questions all the time, like in the comments. And I always feel bad because I'm focusing on the lesson plan and teaching. Um, I mean, I try to address all your questions, but I always kind of get left behind in the comments. And now that one time I'm paying attention to the comments, everyone's quiet. Well, that's Murphy's Law for you. Um, yeah, guys, remember, this is kind of like the midpoint. We've covered a lot of information so far. Are there any issues that you have kind of are struggling with? Any concepts, etc.? Let me know. I'm here to help. So let's see here. What are you stumped on while doing your own score? All right, so the, a, the D minor kind of works. What if we went even further and did a D diminished? We could try that. Would that be too much? At this point, everything is so low. The sketch is going to sound kind of creepy. Um, and the modulation is tricky for piano. Let's, just, let's watch the whole scene again. All right, let's see what happens. And this is really a lot of what it's going to be like when you're working on your own scores. There's a lot of little nitpicking things that you can do. This is a lot of the work. Is once uh, you've got all the big picture stuff done, it's about finding the right details, finding the right way to tell your story. Oh, awesome. Got a question. Greg asks, I'm not sure why, but I'm not understanding the conflict between the rising, your seemingly happy motif in a sad scene in the beginning. What am I not understanding? All right, so a rising or happy motif so the question is so right now what you're looking at uh d minor than d diminished man i like that i really like that uh yeah i think i might try that matt 
Uh, thank you. Um, but Grant asks specifically about the motif, a rising motif at the very beginning. So what you're focused on right now is something called a musical gesture. A musical gesture is kind of like a musical metaphor. It's like it's a way that you portray things. And yes, moving up can provide kind of a happy kind of movement with your motif. That doesn't mean everything that moves up must be sad. Because remember, in lesson two, we talked about the nine parameters of music. Contour, or the shape of your melody, the shape of your motif, is only one of those. And even then, it's kind of a fraction of the contour of pitch. That still leaves us with eight other uh, uh, parameters that can all say something completely differently. So if we look at the harmony, for example, let's look at our chords. We have a G major. Well, that's the opening. So we have a C major. Then we have an A minor. Then we have a D minor. Then an A minor. All right, that's not exactly a happy chord progression. All right, three quarters of that is all minor triads. Um, so you can use harmony to portray it. And even if we listen to the motif itself, the motif is meant to sound more kind of melancholy or a mix of happy and sad. It's got a slow tempo, kind of happier sounding kind of melody, but it's moving slowly. And when paired with the idea, it kind of creates more of a kind of uh, ballad type feeling. So it doesn't necessarily need to be happy. My goal isn't to sound happy. And when I start to arrange it, that'll have an even bigger impact because I can select instruments that have a darker, more somber quality. Um, so kind of the big takeaway from that being that contour, just because one element of your music is traditionally associated with one emotion, doesn't mean that your music is then shoehorned into feeling that one specific mood or vibe. It's all about building context to everything. In fact, the kind of secret to performing emotions with your music is twofold. All right, if you want to portray any emotion with your music, here are your two steps. Step number one is to establish a general vibe for your emotion. The way you do that is you figure out the general what we call valence or energy level of your emotion. Valence is how dark or bright that emotion is. So sadness is a pretty dark emotion. Happiness is a pretty bright emotion. Then you gotta find the energy level, which emotion wise is like how intensely is this emotion experienced? How is another way to think about it is like how is this emotion portrayed physically? All right, so when we're excited, when we're happy, human beings tend to dance. We tend to get excited. We tend to rub our hands together. We tend to laugh. We tend to get loud, talk faster like I am doing right now. Um, all these things are indicative of higher energy. Whereas sadness, if you think about it traditionally, it is experienced as a low energy emotion. You kind of slump in your chair. You sigh. You don't want to move around. You want to just stay in bed all day. That is a lower energy experience. So you can kind of think about how much energy does the emotion give you. Some emotions are emotionally draining. Some are emotionally giving or energetically giving. So once you've got your general vibe, all right, how dark or how bright your emotion is and how much energy that emotion entails, you can use that same exact description to portray your music, to set the vibe, all right? So for example, for sad music, since sadness is a relatively dark emotion and a relatively low energy emotion, if you write music that is also relatively dark and relatively low energy, it's going to have a sad vibe or mood. Now again, all of this is subjective, all right? Music that might sound sad in one setting might sound happier in another because comparatively, it sounds higher energy and brighter than whatever came before it. All right, so there is a little bit of a subjective about it. So that's step one, is setting the vibe or mood. Step two goes back to a little something we talked about earlier, which is the idea of creating a uh, musical gesture. 
or the idea of using your music to metaphorically represent your emotion. This is done all the time, all right? And this is kind of what our nine parameters approach that we learned in lesson two was all about. Well, the idea is like starting out with your story, describing it, and then figuring out how can your music portray that. For example, um, an example that Zach Heide used of emotional, of uh, musical uh, gestures in my interview with him was from the movie The Green Mile. All right, a character is dying, and in the music, we have a piano playing the, mu uh, playing the melody, a very intimate, personal instrument against a backdrop of strings. The moment the character dies, the piano disappears, and all we have is the strings. That's a musical metaphor. The piano represented the character, a very intimate kind of personal performance of the melody. When the character dies, the most intimate personal instrument is removed from the soundtrack. Another example I personally really enjoy is a cue called Epilogue from the movie Everest. And this movie uses massive amounts of reverb, massive amounts of delay to create huge echoes in the music, and which helps kind of metaphorically portray the massive mountain landscape. It kind of recreates the effect of sound in such a massive space. And it also focuses on a very, very intimate instrumentation. Only, I believe it's viola, singer, and piano. Three instruments, and at any given time, only two of them are really playing. Which again, is a very intimate arrangement, and it is used to metaphorically represent the kind of aloneness and intimacy of the adventure and tragedy experienced by the people in the story, of being so isolated on their journey traveling up and down from Mount Everest. So if you can master those two things, first creating the vibe, and secondly, kind of portraying the musical gestures to help metaphorically represent it, you can masterfully portray any emotion, any emotional setting, any character, any mood, any anything that you would like. Now, the trick is learning how to do these things. So if you would like to learn more, you can go over here, go to tabletopcomposer.com, go to my website, go to my blog, and check out How Do You Portray Emotions With Music? And this one focuses entirely on that first step, creating moods. And I provide a little bit about the theory behind it and some templates. For example, how do you create a um, happy mood or vibe? How do you create a sad mood or vibe? How do you do anger? How do you do calm, et cetera, et cetera. So that blog post, 100% free, go on, check it out. That'll give you a nice guide to setting the mood and the vibe. And then part number two, creating the musical gestures. We've already covered that in this class. So you should hopefully, if you've been following along, be an old pro at that by now. But if not, and you're just finding this series, go to lesson number two on the playlist. And we will go in depth in that class on how to use the nine parameters approach. In fact, there's even a nifty little lesson plan that includes all of the information. In fact, I can pull this up. This is kind of my folder. Go to lesson number two, and you can see in here, under planning thematic material, we'll wait for the thing to pop up, we have the, all right, is it lesson, have I been saying lesson number two this entire time and it wasn't in lesson, oh no, yes, right here, the nine parameters of music. Um, Where is it? Uh, yeah, nine parameters approach. So we've got tempo, different questions you can use, rhythm, you've got pitch, articulation, harmony, timbre, register, dynamics, texture, all of this stuff completely free. You can find it in the description of lesson number two. Really cool stuff. This is what I am most passionate about. This is why I got into film scoring. I love telling stories about music, uh, uh, telling stories with music, and emotions is in particular my specialty. For those of you who don't know, I was trained to be a therapist. I have a master's degree in social work and halfway through grad school, that's when I figured out, hey, I don't wanna be a therapist. I've spent six years of my life pursuing something I didn't actually want. Let's try music. Uh, so fun, eclectic little experience for myself. Um, but awesome, so yeah, that's the, I don't even remember what the original question was. I think it was, uh, oh yeah, Greg was talking about the conflict between the, the, that particular musical gesture. Um, Awesome, great, so we are almost at an hour. So, here's the feel, here's the deal. Um, in five minutes, 
I'm going to address the questions I have by then, and then I'm going to call it a day. All right. So if you have questions, throw them below. I know that this video is called Q and A while scoring scene two, and we only really kept working on scene one. But for our next lesson, I will have sketched out both scene one, scene two, scene three. We'll see how many scenes I get to. I don't anticipate scoring the entire film. Unfortunately, my schedule is just super busy and I have a lot of stuff I'm working on. I can't dedicate entirely to scoring this film. But the next lesson, we're gonna learn about orchestrating. All right, we'll learn some useful skills, some genre neutral tools on how to take your sketches of whatever you've written and actually arrange it for whatever ensemble you want. Whether you are doing um, traditional orchestra, you are doing unique ensembles of like uh, local information, uh, local musicians setting the scene for your movie, or whether you're doing something really experimental, anything you'd like, there are a few guiding principles that can help make sure your arrangements are crystal clear and effective. And that's what we'll be learning in the next lesson. Um, but that will be back up to the typical lesson plan, following along with that and doing comments as like a secondary reaction. So if you got any questions, throw them in now. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's listen to this real quick. Then I'll see if I can come up with a minor thing and then I'll answer whatever questions are in the comments. Let's listen to this one last time. By the end of your film, you'll probably be sick of your own music. I know I already am. That's a smoother transition now. <laughs> Got the little run. I kind of like that menacing little... I think it works well. We'll polish it up. <laughs> Alright, so I do not like that. That's a super crunchy ending. We need to fix that. Matt said maybe try a D minor. And then D diminished. I like that. So let's try that. I don't know why that was a diminished. I think I was experimenting with something. So we've got D minor. Then we've got, let's do D diminished. Let's shorten this because what's happening here is this E is running into this one and Cubase will not play notes that are over uh, running over. So I'm just going to do a legato break to create a tiny little break in there. Let's see how that sounds. All right, so that's, oh, we need to do that down. We need to go to F. I don't know why that was E, so that was unnecessary to begin with. Then we'll do to F, we'll go to G, we'll go to A flat. Go to D, just kind of clean this up a little bit. We'll kind of fix this. All right, that kind of works. It's still a little doesn't little crunchy. I'm probably gonna touch it up and fix it. But for now, it works. Again, right now, the priority is just creating a sketch, creating a basic kind of story. Now you would want to do something like this, create a basic sketch on piano for the entire short film. If you're working on a feature length film, that's a different story. But in a short film, you can do the whole film no problem. It's four or five minutes long maximum. And as you're working on it, you create the general flow. And then as you start orchestrating, you can start making more kind of deliberate decisions. So let's see what questions we got. Then we'll listen to this one more time and we'll call it a day because I've got more work I've got to do today. Um, awesome, Danzo Strife. Welcome back, my friend. It says, what's up, Tabletop? Curious, you use stream lamps for your stream. I do not. I use OBS. In fact, I'll bring it up. You guys can see here. I have OBS. You can see the window. It's all going down here. Uh, this is the updated version. In fact, I did this so I could have a compressor. And then, on top of that, you can see YouTube. OBS runs through YouTube, gives me information on the stream, how healthy it is, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, that's my setup. For streams. Uh, Alex, so do you listen to Toby Fox? 
Um, no, not yet. I've got a note. Like I said, on my to-do list of stuff to do today, I took the note, Alex. It says, listen to Toby Fox, Big Shot. I'm excited. I always love listening to new music. But ask me again next week. All right, ask me again next week. We'll see what we got. Uh, I'll have listened to it by then, and I'm excited. Uh, Greg, I noticed you use music libraries. Are those just sounds, or are they loops that can be used? Um, can What do you mean, can loops be used instead of writing my own music to portray the feelings and emotions? So a sound library, um, there are lots of different kinds of libraries. These sound libraries that I work with, the ones I own, are all instrumental libraries. So, for example, when we go to the these Celli, all this is is a sampled cello section. It's struggling at the moment. Just kind of like a little... It's meant to play, right now I've got a very limited one. Typically, it has all kinds of articulations. It's got all kinds of instruments. I tend to lean towards Spitfire libraries. I've got percussion. I do have a couple native instrument things, though, that I'll work with from time to time. Um, but no, I don't do a lot of electronic music yet. I'm working on it. I'm studying electronic music like mad, especially since the latest Spider-Man movie. I think it's like the fifth time I've mentioned that movie because I've loved it so much. That music has, has a tremendous impact. I am studying it like crazy. And we'll probably be doing a couple of tutorial videos in the near future. Um, but because I don't do a lot of electronic music, I don't have sound libraries in terms of whoosh hits or recorded audio files of risers, etc. I use mostly with sample libraries. And the idea of a sample library is it's a synthesizer that uses recordings of specific performance techniques of specific notes on instruments uses these massive libraries of files so that I can just use the sounds on the keyboard to mimic the performance of a real life musician. However, the actual performance itself doesn't necessarily sound realistic. All right, there's still a ton of work you need to do. And if you would like to learn how to make realistic uh, MIDI mockups, shameless little plug, go to my bookshop. I've got a bunch of cool stuff here, including actually, this book right here, this is the uh, the printed copy that I'm going through for my editor, or my publisher, I should say. Um, 36 chapters, nearly 400 pages, covers everything from f initial basics, basics of reading music, all the way to mixing and mastering your own completely original orchestral music. 36 chapters currently being uh, uh, published, but the publishing process takes so long that I've decided to release it temporarily as a digital copy on my website since I've been working on this for quite a while. Uh, as you can see, it's one of my passion projects. Check it out. Um, it will probably be a lot more expensive once it hits the bookshelves because once it goes to stores, I no longer have control over it. But it's being billed as a textbook and my publishers, this is the updated copy. Um, I released the original copy when I first made it. And since then, my publishers asked me, they really liked the storytelling perspective of it. So they asked me to double down on that. And so I ended up adding 40 more pages total uh, of just applying every single chapter in there to story writing. So if you are interested, check out this textbook. Use coupon code IFMC. That's capital I, capital F, capital M, and capital C. Uh, it stands for Indie Film Music Contest to get 15% off anything in here. Uh, but you can get a, you can check out the, um, you can check out the table of contents here. Um, uh, what's going on here? Why didn't it go to where it was supposed to go to? It didn't go where it was supposed to go. All right, I gotta fix that link. Sorry about that. It's supposed to go there. It's, oh, it's there. We go. It's because I had, I copied and pasted the wrong thing. There we go. I included here. There we go. Here's the table of contents. This is where it's supposed to go. Um, everything you need to learn. So shameless little plug for me. You want to show your love, show some support. You want to read a really, really, really good book, if you if I do say so myself. Like I said, 36 chapters covers everything you could possibly need to know. But that's not what I was here. I was here actually here to promote another little book. Also, my book on portraying emotions. I got a lot of cool stuff on here. Uh, ah, yes. Here, the guide to MIDI mock-ups. All right, the idea of how to make your strings and your woodwinds and all of your sound libraries sound as realistic as possible. That's my shameless plug. Again, you can use coupon code IFMC, all caps, to get 15% off your entire order. 
Um, let's see here. Good questions, good questions. Um, so yeah. Uh, Greg Anderson, I use Logic Pro X and not Cubase. Um, uh, can, can loops be used instead of writing my own music to portray feelings and emotions and scenes? I don't know. Probably not. Not as effectively. Remember, anyone can just go on YouTube and find free music and accompany it to their film. Uh, the point of a film composer is you're not just portraying emotions. You are telling the story. Um, so... AI, things like that, will never be able to completely eliminate human beings. And if you'd like to learn more about that, check out my video where I interviewed Zach Heidi and we actually talk about that a little bit. Um, Alex says, don't you think that composition for films is quite limiting? I mean, have you thought about composing for games? Um, I don't think it's limiting at all. Uh, I guess it depends on your definition. Personally, I love telling stories. Video games is cool, but growing up, video games weren't allowed in my house. Um, so I just never grew up with them. I've made up for lost time since then. In college, I got a gaming computer. I played a bunch of games. Even now, I play video games with my roommates. But for me, movies were always where I was at. Movies and TV and shows, all that kind of cool stuff. So for me, I love telling stories. That's my first love. And my favorite way to tell stories is through music. So with a film, I love working with film because I can follow the story and portray it with my music. I've also portrayed, uh, I've also written soundtrack for plays, which is a very uniquely challenging experience, having to write a soundtrack for something that will have different timings every single night. And video games are a beautiful experience as well. Um, it's just something that I haven't really done much of myself. So I wouldn't say it's limiting. I guess I'd be more interested in understanding what you mean by limiting. Maybe I'll agree because, for example, I have to stick to a very linear story with a film. But, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely something I enjoy. And Greg says, thank you for today. I will see you next week. Yes, my friends, thank you. I should actually be wrapping up here. So let's watch this scene one more time because why not? We should all hate my music by the time we're done with this class. I'm going to watch and see if there's anything else. Last chance, right? Last call. Throw your questions below. By the time it's done, I will answer what's left. If there's nothing else, I am ending the stream, my friends. So let's watch this. So I, I'm still not a fan of that ending. I'm probably going to play with it a little bit between lessons. Um, But awesome. Looks like there are no more questions. I'm glad it was helpful, Greg. Thank you to everyone who stopped by. I hope this was helpful. Next week, we'll be having our next lesson a week from today, Tuesday. And then we will finally be tackling orchestration and arranging. So make sure you've got your project finished by then. You've sketched everything out so that you can start applying all the cool lessons we'll have for next week. But until next time, my friends, I will see you in the next video. Keep studying, keep working hard, keep writing new music. Beautiful, beautiful people. Check out my website if you want to help support me. Check out my blog. Check out the things I sell on my website. Remember the coupon code. And if you haven't signed up for the competition yet, make sure you do. You get access to two films to work with. And you can use coupon code TABLETOP to get 10% off. I'll see you all in the next stream. Have a good one.